こうって言ってね。So good afternoon. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to Sardegna Ricerche for the first of hopefully will be many International Scientific School on Novel Psychoactive Substances. Before starting, I'd like, like to say that our thoughts go to the memory of our colleague Sandro Feno, who sadly passed away Saturday. Sandro was a valued member of our scientific community and our faculty, and uh, whose work uh, contributed for many development of many projects, including this school, and uh, where his loss will be very felt. Back to the school, so I think that the area of research of this school is very relevant since the novel psychoactive substances are changing the uh, trend of use of drugs worldwide and are prevalent uh, among youth, posing a significant issue for the public health and safety. For the, this reason, the aim of this school is uh, to provide graduate students, but also postdoc and also working professional with an updated overview of the world of uh, the field in, of novel psychoactive substances. Uh, thus, in order to address uh, uh, the full spectrum of the complex issue of the MPS, we have set our program uh, through four consecutive days, uh, thanks to the faculty of 12 uh, international experts in the field. In addition, tomorrow afternoon, we will have a, a public expert round table with lecturers from the faculty, but also from the school faculty, but also uh, law enforcement representatives. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you that due to the uh, level of interest with the, we, we will have been able to open more places to the school from regional anticipated for students, uh, coming mostly from the University of Cagliari, but also from Padova, from Roma Sapienza, but also from Serbia and Lebanon. And uh, this is a good uh, international context, very important uh, um, and for a significant basis uh, for a fruitful collaboration in future projects. 
Of course, uh, all this project would not be possible, uh, not for our main sponsor, Sardegna Ricerche, and also, uh, but also from the University of Cagliari. I also acknowledge the uh, sponsor of uh, Fulbright Commission for the exchanges between uh, uh, United States and Italy. And uh, also I'd like to thank uh, other sponsors, as the Fondazione di Sardegna, the University of Hertfordshire, the Mediterranean Neuroscience Society, the Società Italiana di Tossicodipendenze, and the Zardigori Foundation, and also Neuro Sardinia, that contributed to travel grants and to full subsidy of the student participation fee. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the Scientific Advisory Board, so Professor Fabrizio Schifano and Pierluigi Caboni, and in particular the Emeritus Professor Gaetano Di Chiara, who I kindly ask to introduce the plenary lecture of today. I thank you very much and I wish you a productive time here at Sardegna Ricerche. Thank you Mary and I have to compliment you for uh, everything that you have you done. Much. I am really impressed. See that uh, we have all this with all the logo. It's fantastic. Keep it because this is uh, very important. Okay, now my uh, job now is to present Michael Newman. I, I, I was uh, with uh, Michael Newman. Uh, Michael Bauman. Uh, yeah, because I just asked you about Newman, <laughs> so it right. remains in the memory as a trace. <laughs> uh, I had the occasion to uh, to spend some time uh, with Michael yesterday at dinner, and then we we, we went together here, and then at lunch, and uh, he he had a very interesting life, I might say. First of all, he was born in Baltimore, and I did ask him, where, where were you born? Because he has got this southern accent, and I thought, maybe he's from Texas, no, he's from Baltimore, but he explained me that there is a so-called Mason-Dixon line in the States, and Balt that separates north from south, and Baltimore just south, just near the line, but south, and that is enough to give him this southern accent that he tries always to to reduce, but uh, you know, if you have a good, uh, um, you can uh, realize it. Um, Michael was born from a, from parents that were musicians, and in fact, he uh, learned very early uh, when he was uh, five years old. For ten years, he had uh, piano lessons. And uh, this uh, influenced his, uh, his life, as I will tell you. So he went to school as undergraduate in biology, you know, four years is, uh, is uh, uh, this is corresponds to the, to, the, uh, to the high school, basically, in Italy. I the, the, this undergraduate. The, the, um, uh, me, me, uh, scuola media superiore, okay? Liceo, etc., etc. Uh, in the States you can al already have a, a kind of uh, specialization, that was biology. Then he went to Rutgers University in New Jersey to do his undergraduate, praticamente la laurea, la nostra laurea. And then he, made, he had a PhD, he made a PhD again in Rutgers on physiology. I thought he was a chemist, but he's not, he's a physiology as a, as a background. Then Okay, then, okay, now here is now the music, because uh, he spent as long as three years between the degree and the PhD playing in a band that was going around in New Jersey playing uh, rock, but particularly jazz. Okay, then finally he realized that he wasn't going to make much money with this band and then he decided to, uh, to stop with that and go uh, uh, and, and do the PhD. After the, after the PhD, this is very interesting, that during the PhD he did learn during night, at night, microdialysis. 
You know, it was just a chance. I didn't know that. We did not select it because of microdialysis. Uh, I just uh, realized this uh, uh, talking with him. And so we did the uh, microdialysis in C. Auerbach Laboratory at Rogers yes. University. And uh, as soon as he got the PhD, he had already the, the place ready in NIDA. Can you imagine this is something that <laughs> I think <laughs> would be very, very strange for us. But anyway, he did because they needed somebody who was able to do microdialysis. Uh, which year was this, by the way? 1991. 19, uh, I mean, very, uh, very recent. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, at NIDA, he worked with... Um, uh, with Richard Rotman, who is a guy that tried uh, many, very much to find an antagonist of cocaine in order to utilize as a treatment for cocaine addiction. But he did not succeed, basically, because the cocaine receptor is not like a, a neurotransmitter receptor. So, I mean, there was no really, uh, basically an antagonist of that receptor is uh, a blocker of reuptake. <laughs> so, it's, it's a cocaine uh, analog, basically, right? So, <clears throat> then Richard Rothman retired, and that was a big problem, because his position at that point was not shaky not very secure, but he was saved by NPS, <laughs> right? Correct. NPS saved his, uh, his job, basically, because uh, uh, thank also, I think, to Antonello Bonci, right? I went to Bonci. He went to Bonci and he said, NPS is the future, and Bonci said, well, maybe. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me let me uh, prepare a pro project, a, a working project with the, with all the the money, the cost, etc., etc. He did that. It was convincing, and therefore they uh, promoted him as a, a chief group on was not called NPS because he was still at the long, very very old. Uh, uh, the uh, old name of designer drug, uh, which is something very old. We, not, we call it NPS, novel rather than new psychiatry. But anyway, that was the same, same stuff. And so, right now, he's uh, head of this group in the, in, the, in the lab that is headed by a... Uh, I'm under Bunchy, actually, Antonello Bunchy. Antonello, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, so... Please, this is your thank you. Stage is up to you. Thanks so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, and also thanks for uh, having me and allowing me to talk a little bit about my research um, in the field of novel psychoactive substances. And just as a point of clarification in my talk, I'm oftentimes referring to NPS as new psychoactive substances, but actually this is the same thing, right? The term novel psychoactive substances is an international term. It's probably a better term than new psychoactive substances, but those terms are used interchangeably uh, on, on an international uh, stage. I believe that uh, EMCDDA is using novel as, as NPS, as novel psychoactive substances, so just as a point of clarification. When I was just beginning my research at NIDA, uh, we had cocaine to study, methamphetamine to study, marijuana and alcohol. We had just a few substances. But now, in this world today, there's an endless number of substances that are on the market. They're hidden in many cases. They're cloaked, they're disguised as uh, additives and other substances, as counterfeit pain medications, um, but also as frank, illicit drugs of abuse. And so I'm going to give you some background information that hopefully set the stage for all of you to know about these substances 
when they're mentioned in subsequent talks here at the school. So brief uh, presentation outline here. Uh, actually, so the screen isn't advancing. I'm advancing, but the screen is not. Let's see. Oh yeah, maybe I need to do something here. Although I really do like this slide. It really, it is, it is a very, very nice, very nice slide. I like the little flask, actually, motif. I have my slides on the screen here. They're just not on that screen. Maybe, I wonder, is there something I should do here? Should I touch it? Could potentially be disaster if I touch it, right? <laughs> it's not on the screen. That's, that's the problem. There we go. Yeah, see, I could have done that. Oh, maybe not. Oh. There it is. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned already, new psychoactive substances, NPS, the same as novel psychoactive substances. But what we have here is really a changing face of recreational drug abuse because we have so many, a plethora of substances from many different chemical structures and many different targets in the central nervous system. However, as I'll show you today, it's not an overwhelming number of targets in the central nervous system because most of these MPS, they exert their effects similar to their progenitors or the drugs they intend to mimic. So we'll talk a little bit about MPS and I'll, I'll explain what's going on with the designer drug research unit. My small lab at NIDA, how we work, how we operate, what, what are the goals of the lab, and then we'll pretty much laundry list these substances. We'll start with cannabinoid NPS, stimulant NPS, hallucinogen NPS, and then opioid NPS. Those are the four main types of drugs. So when we talk about novel psychoactive substances, we're talking about alternatives to traditional drugs of abuse. They're man-made for the most part. In the first bullet point here, one of the important things to notice one thing they all have in common is, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. They're specifically engineered to evade existing drug control laws. This is the one thing they all have in common. This is an engineered product. It's made to evade legislation so that they can be used or abused, as the case may be, legally. They're almost always sold under false pretenses. They used to be non-drug products like spice or bath salts, but more and more what's happening is they're serving as adulterants in illicit substances and even counterfeit medications when we're talking about things like uh, oxycodone pills on the street in the US. Most of the time these are not oxycodone, they're some fentanyl analog. They're easy to obtain from the internet, Resale establishments and more and more from clandestine markets and street dealers. Most of the time, especially when these substances first arrive on the market, they're used without detection because urine toxicology tests don't identify the substances. So these are the things that all the NPS have in common. We can more formally define these within the context of international treaties, for example, the UN treaty. These are defined as individual drugs in pure form and complex preparation that are not scheduled, so this is the legal component. They're not under law, they're not scheduled, under the single convention on narcotic drugs or the convention on psychotropic substances. The other part of this is, is they can cause harm to public health, right? It's an important component of the definition. But it is really important for everyone here to know that, that I call MPS alternatives to traditional drugs. This is my, sort of my, you know, off the cuff uh, definition, 
But there is a very formal definition that's related to the context of these international treaties. The number and variety of MPS are increasing at an alarming rate on a global scale. This is just a little blur from the most uh, recent uh, World Drug Report from the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. And you don't have to read all this. This is the most important thing. 739 different NPS have been uh, identified and are be being followed by the uh, Emergency Warning Network. So since 2009, this is seven years, so it's approximately 100 per year, right? This is incredible number of substances. It's almost overwhelming in scope when you think of this number of substances. How can you study all of these things? Many of which we don't know anything about. They're manufactured and marketed in much the same way. They're made in Asian companies and they're sold in bulk to distributors via the internet. Now, what I have here in this simple cartoon is for a very small outlay of money. These end users and distributors and dealers can make tremendous profits. So people ask me the question, what is really driving the NPS problem? Money. Money. And this is becoming very, very difficult in the U.S. because drug dealers have figured out we can get fentanyl, we can get uh, amphetamine analogs, we can get any drug we want from the Internet. Much easier than the traditional uh, avenues for trafficking substances of abuse. As I've already mentioned, the Internet is a wild card in this whole process. So what is it about the internet that, that, that is so critical? Well, it's critical to all aspects of the MPS phenomenon. We're at the time now where biomedical research has identified the mechanism of action for all drugs. We know how drugs work in the brain. Online databases describe recipes for making drugs that target those mechanisms. Marketing and sale of these substances on websites allows anonymous purchases. So, so in the United States, a teenager can't go to the store and get a cigarette. A teenager can't go to the store and get a bottle of beer. But from their living room, if they have their mother's credit card number, they can order powerful psychotropic drugs to their home. Okay? So this is serious. The ability to make anonymous purchase can't be overstated. What about trip reports? Most folks here are probably already familiar with these. Blue light, earwid, lithium. These are places where people actually share their drug-taking experiences, right? And so you can go onto these websites and fine-tune your uh, 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 drug-taking experience. So, hundreds of drugs. How do we categorize all of these substances? It's impossible to categorize them by their chemical structure. There's no rhyme or reason to the chemical structure. If you throw these 700 drugs down on the table, they encompass a tremendous variety of chemical templates. However, if we look at the target in the brain, this is a great way to categorize these. And we can take this overwhelming number of substances and nicely nest them into various groups. The cannabinoid NPS, sometimes referred to generically as spice or K2. Back in the day, they were called potpourri. These spice compounds, they all induce marijuana-like effects via agonist actions at the CB1 receptor, the cannabinoid 1 receptor in the CNS. Stimulant-like NPS, in the US, these were first known as bath salts in 2010 and 2011 when they first came onto the scene. In, in Europe, in UK, for example, methadrone, right, is one that's very, very common still. These induce cocaine-like effects via interaction at monoamine transporters in the brain. So these don't hit receptors. They hit transporter proteins, and in particular, the dopamine transporter. Hallucinogenic NPS, or N-bombs, these are the common, highly potent LSD-like substances, and they activate 5-HT2A receptors predominantly in the prefrontal cortex. And finally, synthetic opioids, the various fentanyl analogs that are now on the market worldwide, 
These induce morphine-like effects via agonist action at the mu opioid receptor, very specific receptor subtype. So, uh, as Dr. Chiara mentioned when he was giving my introduction, at some point in maybe 2010, uh, 2010, early 2011, when Richard Rothman had retired, I went to the uh, powers that be at NIDA IRP and I said to them, this is a problem. This NPS situation is going to explode. And uh, thankfully, they were very uh, sympathetic to my ideas and have been supportive, very supportive of this of this initiative. The mission of the DDRU, which by the way was created in response directly to the NPS problem. It was created in response to the bath salt problem in the US and also the SPICE K2 problem. And so the mission of the DDRU is to collect, analyze, and disseminate the most up-to-date information about NPS. And the goals are fivefold. Surveillance. The first thing is, if we have 700 substances, how can we choose the substances that are important to study? You can't study 700 substances in any detail. Preclinical evaluation. This is to determine the molecular mechanism of action and the basic pharmacology. In many cases, we have some indication already of what these things are doing, but there always are surprises. Risk assessment. This is to evaluate the abuse potential, but also other adverse effects. Forensic investigation, to develop forensic assays for looking at the parent compound and its metabolites. Because in many cases, you have bioactive metabolites for these NPS. And also to establish pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic relationships. How does drug concentration relate to drug effects? This is very important for translational uh, um, medicine. For example, what is the first thing that happens with most NPS? They kill someone, this person comes to, they come to the hospital and they die under emergency care. And what do you have from these patients? You have some blood, you have some urine, and you need to determine what was the concentration of these substances in this fatality, right? And we can actually model this. We can model PDPK relationships in, animal, in the animal model to try to get an idea of what is the uh, amount of the substance that's necessary for the recruitment of adverse effects. And finally, data dissemination. And this is mostly papers. Uh, we publish papers in the scientific literature, but I also go to schools. I also have the just incredibly great fortune to come to a place like Sardinia, right? Fabulous. And this is part of my job, to, to give information about these substances. This is just a block diagram. Same thing I just told you. Um, Chuck Schindler is involved in risk assessment. Uh, NIDA headquarters is involved in helping me with forensic investigation. Unfortunately, Marilyn Hustis, some of you may know of her, she was my longtime collaborator in this forensic component, and she's since retired, and so the laboratory is no longer uh, active. Um, and this is the surveillance. You'll see this box up here is different color, and there's a bunch of acronyms here, and I'll explain these in the next slide. Surveillance has become a really critical piece of the operation of the DDRU because there's so many drugs. How can we study? Which ones do we study? We use data from Poison Control Center, from the Drug Enforcement Administration, Terry Booz at the, uh, at the DEA. He's an acting branch chief at the DEA. And he has been very gracious to allow me to, in real time, I can look at this database, the National Forensic Laboratory Information System. You probably have an analogous database here in Italy or in any other European country. What this is, this is a data state federal law enforcement. When they confiscate some drug product, it all goes into a database, right? What is it that they found? What was identified in this product? The problem with the NIFLA system is they publish something once per year. It's a really long time for them to get all this data together and put out their bulletin. By the time their bulletin is published, the drug landscape is completely different. 
So because of my contacts with the DEA, I'm able to assess this database in real time as they're collecting data. National Drug Early Warning System, NDUS, this is a phenomenal epidemiological organization. And what they do is they get on the internet, they basically troll the internet looking for new substances. They are looking for trends in drug abuse research. And really, the leading organization in that regard, I would say NDUS is copying EMCDDA. EMCDDA is far ahead, light years ahead of the United States in terms of monitoring drug abuse trends. So here in Europe, you really do have the uh, sort of um, equipment for looking at drugs of abuse as they occur on the street in real time via the EMCDA and its network. So how do we choose? We identify a problematic MPS based on all of the information that I just told you. The NIFLIS data, the data from drugs in the street, typically only drugs that have been encountered at least 1,000 times per year. So this is 1,000 different times this drug has been seen, whether it's been seen as a kilogram or one dose, liminally, at least 1,000 times. The other issue about the, the sur surveillance is if people are killed, when drugs cause fatalities, we fast track those. We study those very quickly, the drugs that are known to be causing fatalities. But in reality, the DDRU is a pharmaceutical company. It's analogous. Instead of studying lead compounds for medicinal chemists, we're studying compounds that are killing people on the street. And we do SAR, structure activity relationship uh, types of studies. We get synthesis of purified drugs and metabolites. This is absolutely essential. You have to have these, not only for doing the uh, pharmacology, but also the forensic assays. You need reference standards. So you have to have chemists that will make pure preparations of these drugs. In vitro testing is a very straightforward, stepwise process. We test at receptors and at transporters. One name I don't have up here is Brian Roth. He runs the PESP, the Psychoactive Drug Screening Program for the NIMH. This system of testing will look at your drug of interest at 300 different GPCRs, transporters, enzymes, etc. And so you get a profile of many different targets. And then finally we move in testing road models, we do microdialysis, has already been mentioned, we do uh, radio telemetry, and some of these different methods will come uh, um, clear as I go further in the talk. So that's the background on the DDRU. Now just as a point uh, uh, of, uh, to put this in context, this will be review for most people here. Many people here are already very conversant in neuroscience, you may be experts in your field, but just so everyone's on the same page, how do drugs work in the brain? Well, at the most fundamental level, these drugs of abuse are acting by altering chemical transmission at neuronal synapses. So we have a simple model here, an electrically active cell, right? An excitable cell, neuron number one, fires an action potential, releases neurotransmitters that impinge on axon number two, and somehow, uh, or sorry, neuron number two, and somehow affect its excitability. They either stimulate that neuron or they inhibit that neuron. So it's really Im important to note this area here, the synapse, the area where two cells come together, this is the critical locus of activity for these drugs of abuse. And it's so critical that we're going to zoom in with our microscope Right? And we're going to look at it in some detail to identify the players that could be involved in the actions of drugs. So here you see a presynaptic terminal. If you reflect back to the previous cartoon, this is neuron one, the presynaptic terminal, the postsynaptic cell, and here's the space between those two cells. Most of the types of transmitters that I'm talking about today are packaged in vesicles. So this is the cytoplasm of this neuron. You have neurotransmitters here represented as small little dots. And they're packaged in vesicles 
and those vesicles move towards the plasma membrane and they are released. The vesicles release their contents into the synapse. This is that chemical signaling that I was telling you about. When this vesicle releases its contents out here, let's just say this is dopamine. This dopamine can do many things. This transmitter has many potential fates. It can bind to a stimulatory receptor on the postsynaptic membrane, generating what's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP. It can bind to an inhibitory receptor, right? Initiating an IPSP, an inhibitory response. It can bind to a, a presynaptic receptor, an autoreceptor. Many times the cells themselves have an autoreceptor that serves to dampen the activity of these cells. Okay? For the monoamines like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, even glutamate for that matter, and GABA, they're taken back up into the cell by a transporter protein. This transporter here, its job is to vacuum up these transmitters and recycle them back into vesicles, okay? In fact, it turns out this transporter is really important for terminating the action of released transmitters, right? So that they can be taken out of the synapse and put back into vesicles and recycled and the whole process continues again. Now, the reason I spend so much time here with this slide and these characters is because we're going to see these characters again. Each of the drugs of, of abuse that we're going to talk about is going to target a different character. A positive postsynaptic receptor, a negative postsynaptic receptor, a presynaptic receptor, or a transporter. So now we'll get into looking at the actual drugs themselves. Synthetic cannabinoid products or the spice compounds, they consist of plant material laced with drug. So it turns out that these days, there are other products. You can actually get the liquids, which are pure synthetic cannabinoids. And these are incredibly dangerous because of the potency of these compounds. But still in the marketplace today, in the United States at least, most of the products look like this. They look like, you know, they look like reefer. They look like marijuana. Um, but it's plant material with substance sprayed on it. Uh, one thing of note here, in each case when we look at the different drugs, I'll, I'll show you the natural occurring THC, the plant-based THC, and, and an example of one of the uh, synthetic ones. And you don't have to be a chemist to tell that these structures are completely different. Completely different. These structures are, are nothing like THC. They're nothing like the cannabinoid structure. In fact, they are uh, naphthol, right? Indoles, naphthol indoles, synthetic cannabinoids. Now this is an old one. This is the granddaddy of all synthetic cannabinoids, JWH18. This was the first one. The effects of these cannabinoid MPS, they mimic the effects of marijuana, which is, you know, not surprising because that's why the synthetic cannabinoids were designed in the first place as research tools to study the CB1 receptor. One thing is, though, they can be much stronger. When I say much stronger, I mean more potent, much more potent. How they're used, they're smoked using bongs, pipes, or joints. More and more, we're seeing vaping of the liquid via e-cigarette technology. In middle school, in middle school, we have kids that are taking the liquid from synthetic cannabinoids, putting it in their vape pen, and while they're in social studies class, hit in the back, taking hits in the back of the classroom, and falling back off the chair, blacking out. And think of the horror of the teacher that finds the student unconscious in, in, in the room. Again, this is because the kids are able to get the raw materials necessary for this type of, 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 of um, administration and there's no odor. If, you, if you're smoking a bong hit or a pipe or a joint, there's some odor when you're burning this. Vaping, not so much. This can be done without detection. Psychoactive effects. The positive mood and euphoria, they're very similar to marijuana. Perceptual distortion are similar to the effects of marijuana, but they can be much more potent than THC. The other issue with these synthetic cannabinoids is their full agonist at the cannabinoid receptor, whereas THC is a weak partial agonist. And we'll look at some potency curves in a second. Adverse effects, there's many. Increased heart rate, 
vomiting, hyperemesis. These are people that vomit uncontrollably after smoking these. Imagine this would be a very horrible kind of uh, effect. Kidney injury, there's many instances of serious, serious kidney damage, renal damage from, from these substances. Um, at higher doses, hallucinations, persistent psychosis, psychotic episodes that don't resolve, and finally seizures. <coughs> Coma and death as well, much rarer to see death with synthetic cannabinoids, but there are documented cases with some of the newer analogs. So the legislation banning these spiced cannabinoids has fostered the appearance of new analogs. In the United States, when a substance is new to the street, people are taking and getting high, and you start to see adverse effects in emergency rooms and from poison control centers, the knee-jerk response is law enforcement. They go to the government, and the DEA will schedule the drug to make it illegal. And I believe this is a good thing to do. What else can you do, right? There has to be some mechanism for controlling these things. However, there's always unintended consequences of this type of, of legislation. And in the case of NPS, not just the cannabinoids, I'll show you in every case, this has led to a plethora of what we call replacement analogs. These are analogs to replace those ones that have been made illegal. And here you see JWH, as we saw before, is a naphthoil indole, right? as is AM2201. The next generation, look what they did. They took off the naphthol group and they put it on a tetramethyl cyclopropyl. This very simple three-membered ring, the cyclopropyl, still had your indole, right? These came out in, I would say, 2013, 2014. These were subsequently replaced when they were made illegal so this is illegal. This is illegal from the first wave of registration. UR-144 and XLR-11 were made illegal more recently with the next wave of legislation. As soon as the legislation was passed, now we have these uh, Pinaka, Fubinaka, Chiminaka. And you'll notice what's happened here. We've turned this into just a, 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 you know, a, 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 a carbon chain. And now we're using an indazole here instead of an indole. And so you can imagine the permutations here are endless. The chemists just continue to change the molecule in subtle ways. And these indazole analogs are now the ones that are really predominant on the street, uh, as I show you here. So this is some of that um, um, NIFLIS data. This um, data from the DEA, from confiscations on the street. Now, I should clarify. This is data from the DEA laboratory. So this is only data from a laboratory to DEA. So DEA. This is not state, local, and federal. This is just what the federal lab has, has uh, confiscated. And so what you can do with this type of data, it's called an emerging threat report. These are, these are put out every quarter, a quarterly threat report. And you can get these yourself if you wish to. I get them through NDUs. Um, the National Drug Early Warning System, even though this is the United States organization, anybody who wants can join NDUs. They have thousands of people on their listserv. Anyone can join. And through NDUs, you can have access to these reports, these emerging threat reports that come out quarterly. And what you can think of this is not an exhaustive number. So, so quantitatively, it's not important. Qualitatively, though, it gives you a snapshot what's on the street at the time. And you'll notice this is just, you know, uh, the reason why some of the bars are hatched, these are the ones that uh, I've studied in the laboratory, right? So you'll see I'm way behind. I haven't, I haven't studied many of these. We are actually studying uh, 5 fluoro AMB. These things are coming fast and furious. And so this is just an idea of the complexity of the current drug landscape in terms of synthetic cannabinoids. This tells you how many times they were encountered by law enforcement, specifically those these are items coming to the DEA, so these are federal drug busts, and this is a different type of compound. So, how do THC and synthetic cannabinoids work? They work in the same manner. They bind to CB1 receptors on the presynaptic nerve terminal. So, we're going back to that cartoon of the synapse here. And what happens with, this, with uh, the cannabinoids, they bind to this presynaptic receptor. Now, in this particular case, the hippocampal glutamate terminal 
it's been really well characterized in terms of electrophysiology. The uh, glutamate slice preparation, you can evoke glutamate release, and you can measure EPSPs in the postsynaptic cell. So it's a really beautiful way of looking at cannabinoid modulation of glutamate release. And you have an enriched population of CB1 receptors in this region, and these receptors are implicated in a lot of the problems with memory, for example, that you see with high-dose cannabinoid administration, right? Sort of the cognitive problems that you would have with taking these types of substances. Anyway, getting back to the point, here's our synthetic cannabinoid here. And it's actually released from this postsynaptic cell. It's a retrograde transmission, right? It's released from here. An endogenous cannabinoid is released from here normally, right? Normally, you have endocannabinoids that are released from the postsynaptic cell back. Here, we've hijacked that mechanism. This black dot right here, this is our synthetic cannabinoid binding to the CB1 receptor. And of course, this is a negative receptor or inhibitory receptor. What happens when you have binding to that CB1 receptor? Now we've even, we've come in even more now to look what happens in terms of uh, intracellular cascades. These substances are, uh, they are um, coupled to the G sub I. This receptor binding inhibits activity of adenylate cyclase, so cell firing and transmitter release are inhibited. So these are inhibitory presynaptic effects. This is what happens with endogenous cannabinoids, right? It's what happens with THC. The difference is with the NPS, many of these are orders of magnitude more potent than THC. So how do we study these? Well, first thing we do, we look at binding. We look at binding uh, in, uh, in cells and also in brain tissue. But this is a wonderful assay, as I've already mentioned, the slice preparation, the hippocampal slice. THC inhibits presynaptic glutamate release and the corresponding EPSPs in the hippocampus. So what we're looking at here is the EPSP, that excitatory potential on that postsynaptic cell from the cartoon, that EPSP is generated by glutamate release, which you can evoke by stimulus. And here, what you see at low concentration, you have 100% of the ESP, EPSP. That is, your EPSP is fully effective. But as you start to increase the concentration of, of a THC, look what happens. The ability to, for this EPSP to, to uh, be measured goes down directly related to inhibition of glutamate release. And you can express this as percent inhibition of the EPSP, and you get this beautiful dose effect curve where you can calculate an EC50, and for this THC, it's about 700 nanomolar. Now, one of the things you'll want to note here, when we get into the uh, concept of efficacy, right, you would say if THC was fully efficacious in this assay, we would be able to completely stop the EPSP. Can't do it. We're only able to block by about 50% with THC. Here's JWHO18. It looks identical, right? The curves, the effects, very, very similar. Um, as we begin to add JWH into the incubation medium, we completely uh, inhibit the EPSPs to about 50%, same about the same efficacy that we saw with THC. The critical variable here is, look at the concentration, EC50. 16 nanomolar versus 700 nanomolar in the previous slide. Much, much more potent in its ability to exert this effect. Here's a summary of some data. All of this data was carried out by Alex Hoffman at the NIDA RRP in, uh, in Carl Lupica's lab. This is the published paper in Addiction Biology. The important point here, though, the take-home message is these NPS inhibit glutamate release with differences in potency, but not efficacy. This was strange finding for us because when you look in vitro assays at THC versus synthetic cannabinoids, the synthetic cannabinoids are full agonists, whereas THC is a partial agonist. But you'll notice the efficacy in these assays that involve intact cells, right? There really isn't a difference in efficacy but you see tremendous differences in potency. 
Here you see that JWH-018 and AM-2201 are far shifted to the left. Now, I don't know if folks are used to looking at these pharmacology curves, but one of the key things to look at, first of all, this is a long dose concentration. So these shifts in the curves are big shifts. The other thing is, the more potent drugs will be shifted to the left, right? This leftward shift, extremely potent. Here's an interesting factoid about synthetic cannabinoids. XLR11, look at it. It's almost equipotent with THC. Do you remember I showed you the current drugs that are on the street? The vast majority of them were these new indazole compounds, but there was one old compound that remains very popular on the street. I swear I didn't do anything. XLR11, so I still have it on my screen. I still have it on my screen. What did he do the last time? Is, is, is our friend here helping us? XLR11 is still very popular on the street despite the fact that it is, it's illegal. Remember I told you the current drug situation? Look what the first one is. There are a lot of these indazoles around, right? There's a lot of indazoles. Yeah. But the main one is XLR11. It still remains, despite the fact that it's illegal. And, you know, you could, we could speculate all we want about this. Like, you know, what does this really mean? might mean nothing. But what it might mean is the street people that use, the people that are using these substances, it's kind of an autocorrecting market, right? These kind of drugs right here that are extremely potent, cause bad side effects, maybe they don't like so much. But one that's right here, the sweet spot, just like THC, right? Again, that's speculation on my part, mere speculation. What about in vivo effects? Now, these are data here from uh, a telemetry. These are tele telemetry data. And what we have here is an implanted sensor in the IP cavity of the animal that allows us to get temperature and locomotor activity and lots of other data, but I'm focusing here on temperature because it's well established that THC can cause sustained dose-dependent hypothermia in animals. And here we see this beautiful dose-dependent hypothermia that bottoms out at about 34 degrees. This is a popsicle. This is a cold animal, right? This is, this is a, a really big change in temperature. We all know here, right, temperature is, is really tightly regulated by homeostatic mechanisms. It's critical that the temperature remain constant. So this kind of change is quite large, um, and it's easy to measure, and it's reproducible. JWH18 does the same thing, although one thing I want you to note here is that it's almost like on and off, right? It's really not quite as dose-dependent as the previous data that we just looked at, right? Um, but still, it bottoms out at about uh, 34 degrees. If we look at all of these drugs that I mentioned previously in the, in the uh, hippocampal slice preparation, these NPS induce hypothermia with differences in potency but not efficacy. Once again, we don't see that the synthetic cannabinoids are more efficacious despite the fact they're full agonists. What we see is differences in potency. Remember the potency? I don't know if I should quiz you, right? How did the drugs look last time in our last potency curve? Very similar. JWH and AM2201 were left shifted, right? Whereas look at THC and XLR11, really similar effects in vivo. So this, the, the, the sort of way we look at these drugs in terms of their potency, the in vitro the hippocampal slice and the in vivo all line up in terms of relative potency. We did many experiments here. One obvious one is we can reverse the hypothermic effects of the drugs with Romanovant, right? This is a CB1 antagonist. Um, here you see, uh, um, actually these are the two important bars. This is the vehicle THC giving us our hypothermic response and here's reversal in the presence of, of Romanovant for THC and JWH. Okay, next type of drug, synthetic stimulants, often called bath salts, 
um, they're not called bath salts so much back uh, at home anymore. Uh, the term now, and not, not only in the U.S., but globally now, is RCs, research chemicals, right? It's research chemicals, this is code for stimulant type NPS. These synthetic stimulants consist of dry powders or crystals. And here's a picture of cocaine. Here's a picture of MDPV, one of the principal constituents of bath salts. And it's one that I'll focus on a lot today because there's a lot of analogs of this substance still on the street in the United States, but also in Europe, also in the European Union. These drugs are, are, are still out there. And it's regional, it's local kind of situation. In some places, in some countries in Eastern Europe, these types of synthetic stimulants have replaced heroin and cocaine as the IV drug of choice. And someone would ask, well, why would a heroin user now use MDPV? Because these people want some drugs. The cheaper drug, the easier drug to get is the drug they use. Yeah. It's unbelievable some of the patterns of self-injection of these stimulants in Eastern European countries at this time. Very, very bad. Uh, also, the MDPV it, it is distinct from cocaine. I should be watching this guy to know what he did, because now I don't know how to get back there. You still here? Is the pointer doing it? Maybe the pointer's doing it. Maybe it's the pointer that's doing it. Because it's only the screen. The screen here is fine. So you're closing and reopening it. That's how you're doing it. Okay, back to the synthetic stimulants. I'm, maybe the pointer is doing it, interfering with the signal. Um, the methods of use for these, oral ingestion, snorting, intravenous injection is the most problematic route, as I've already mentioned. The vast majority of people, though, are taking these things, either oral or snorting them. The psychoactive effects include uh, euphoria, increased energy, very similar to what you see with cocaine, but they can be much more potent. Adverse consequences and Include increased heart rate and blood pressure, hyperthermia, agitation, delirium, psychosis, and death. And by the way, there's going to be talks here at, at the NPS school that go into these uh, uh, the medical consequences in much more detail. Legislation banning the bath salt stimulants has fostered the appearance of new analogs, similar to what we saw already. And let's see. You can't see my pointer on the screen. Okay. Um, You'll see amphetamine and cathinone, and you'll notice that I have this uh, oxygen, this double bonded oxygen circled. All of the cathinone analogs have this beta keto group, and they're often generically referred to as beta keto amphetamines. I really want to use this pointer, but I don't want to make the thing go mental again. Um, right? Here it is. It's everywhere. It's in all these substances. And so you really have an amphetamine structure nested in here with the beta ketone. Um, these here were the original bath salts, cathinones. They were made illegal. And these are just some examples of the replacement analogs. You know, what do they do to make a replacement analog? Here they took a methyl, made an ethyl. Here they took a methyl, made an ethyl. Here, they just knocked off the methylene dioxy group. This is a really bad drug in the, U in the U.S. It's called FLACA. It's finally subsiding, but it's killed many people in Florida, alpha PVP. Um, and so, once again, we see this sort of common feature, though. The drugs are made illegal by legislation, and after legislation is enacted, you get a whole bunch of replacement drugs. And uh, I really don't have enough time today to talk about the stimulants, but there's really interesting SAR with these stimulants. Okay, here is a U.S. Uh, snapshot. Methylone and MDPV analogs are the most common drugs now. And you'll see I have ethylone and, and alpha PVP uh, hatched. These are drugs we've studied in, in, in quite 
in quite uh, great detail looking at their mechanism. Now we're back to the cartoon of our uh, nerve terminal and our synapse. So how do these drugs work? Here we see uh, extracellular dopamine. This dopamine is taken up by the dopamine transporter and put into vesicles. Our little triangle there, MDPV, it blocks the opening. And it actually binds to the substrate binding site where dopamine binds and is taken up. By blocking that site, if we continue to have ongoing vesicular release, that dopamine has nowhere to go except higher in concentration because it can't be taken back into uh, the presynaptic cell. And you'll notice this nucleus accumbens, dopamine terminal, this has been really studied a lot. These dynamics of these terminals in the nucleus accumbens shell, core, anterior pole, and in fact, the anterior pole, the shell, and the core all have somewhat different afferent inputs and somewhat different regulation of their dopaminergic transmission. But drugs of abuse are always affecting, the, affecting the, this dopamine transporter, not just in the accumbens, but also in cortex and other areas of brain where you have these. The dopamine transporter protein its function is to move extracellular dopamine back into cells. So I'm calling this uh, protein DAT, the dopamine transporter. But what I'm telling you for DAT is the same for NET, the norepinephrine transporter, CERT, the serotonin transporter. It's the same. These transporters have the same uh, role. And this is to take this transmitter from the extracellular space and shuttle it back inside. They're channel-like proteins. They're membrane-bound. They're embedded in the plasma membrane. They're responsible for dopamine uptake. And dopamine uptake, as I mentioned, is the critical piece for terminating dopamine action. So any drug that disrupts the dopamine transporter will really affect dopamine transmission. In particular, it will increase dopamine in the extracellular fluid. You'll have elevations in synaptic dopamine but also in dopamine far away from the synapse. Volume transmission, right? Extrasynaptic dopamine is really going up as well. There's your dopamine, just went in there. And again, there's not enough time for me to get into detail about this today, but there's two different ways that drugs can interact at the dopamine transporter. They can act as a blocker or an uptake inhibitor. So what these drugs do is they get on the transporter and sit there at the extracellular face. But some drugs actually can act as false substrates. That is, they do th the same thing dopamine does. They bind to the transporter and then are transported inside. These particular drugs will then cause the transporter to run in the reverse direction. And this is really an amphetamine is the classic example of this when we talk about amphetamine induced release. This is transporter mediated release and this is the DAT or the dopamine transporter running in the opposite direction. It's essentially held open so intracellular dopamine comes pouring out. So it's really critical to denote the differences between a blocker and a substrate. It's not the point of this talk but it's important for folks to know about this. Both types of drugs will inhibit uptake because they bind to the transporter. Because they bind to the transporter, they increase extracellular dopamine. But substrates, those drugs that actually go inside of the nerve terminal, they enter neurons, they induce a sodium current. They actually induce a sodium current that's sufficient to depolarize neurons. And as I've already mentioned, they trigger reverse transport so that dopamine goes out by a transporter-dependent mechanism. Uh, and finally, calcium sensitivity and autoreceptor sensitivity, you'll notice there is none for transporter-mediated release. And what this means in real terms, you can get tremendous elevations in extracellular dopamine with these uh, substrates. But we're not going to talk about substrates. We're going to talk about the more simple interaction, and that is uptake blockers, because 
the problem drugs right now are actually uptake blockers. I've already mentioned MDPV. MDPV and its analogs are potent uptake blockers at DAT and NET. So they hit the dopamine transporter, the nor norepinephrine transporter, but they don't do anything to CERT. They're essentially dead at the serotonin transporter. And let's look at some data to, to convince you of this. Here we see dopamine uptake. Here we see serotonin uptake. And this is a synaptosome assay. It's a synaptosome assay. A synaptosome can be thought of as a sealed nerve ending. And these synaptosomes will take up 100% of the radio labeled dopamine. All of it will be taken up by the synaptosome. And they take it up basically by the DAT. The DAT will do its job. And similar for CERT. But what happens when we start to increase the dose of our drug? We start to dose dependently decrease the ability for the cell or the synaptosome to take up dopamine. This is a classic uptake inhibition curve. As dose is increased, the ability to take up dopamine is completely blocked. Now one of the things about this slide is I'm showing you three different analogs. From MDPV to alpha PVP, the only difference is we've take, taken off that phenyl ring methylene dioxy. So these, these two are quite similar, except for the ring substitution. But these other three, PBP and PPP, a lot of P's there, what's really going on? It's a smaller chain. That's the only difference. I'm going to show you some structures here. We'll go back to the structures. I don't want to reverse all this, but just to put the context here, Remember, so here's alpha PDP and MDPV. The only difference is we've removed this to create this. Those analogs that I'm showing you in that dopamine uptake picture, we chop this from three carbons to two carbons to one carbon. That's all we're doing to those, okay? So if we go back to the picture of the data, look what's happening to potency as we this is three carbon chain, two carbon chain, methyl group. Look, the potency is stepwise getting weaker. So this long chain here, we call this the hook, that's hanging off of that molecule is incredibly important for the potency of these drugs. So how, part, how, how potent are they? To put this in perspective, the weakest drug here is, this is more potent than cocaine, all right? So this substance here is at least 10 times more potent than cocaine. Alpha, uh, alpha PVP is about 10 times more potent than cocaine. So these are tremendously potent drugs. Oh, one thing I didn't say, but maybe you already got this. There's nothing going on over here. Now there is a serotonin. We, we, we can almost get a serotonin IC50 for MDPV, but look at, look at the scale. Here we, we're at 10 to the minus 10th. Here we start at 10 to the minus 9th. So this is like high micromolar versus low nanomolar, right? So there's at least a hundred fold difference in potency. And this is this that cert ratio over here, right? This is the ratio of potency between the dopamine transporter and the serotonin transporter. These are very highly selective for the dopamine and the norepinephrine transporter, not cert. Uh, what do they do to neurochemistry? These are microdialysis data. These microdialysis data show dopamine and serotonin. MDPV, alpha PVP looks exactly the same. That's why up here in the title I say MDPV and alpha PVP increase extracellular dopamine but not serotonin in nucleus accumbens. This is an IV bolus injection, 0.1 milligram per kilogram gives a nice increase in dopamine. 0.3 milligram per kilogram an hour later, a threefold higher dose gives a nice bump, bigger bump. So it's a dose dependent increase. And our serotonin is completely flat. These drugs don't touch the serotonin system at all. This translates directly into locomotor activation for these animals. These are the same animals that I just showed you in the previous slide, but in this case, we're looking at their activity and their level of stereotopy or repetitive movements. And we're able to get this kind of information from the animals because they're in a locomotor box with photo beams around the locomotor box. So we carry out the microdialysis in an arena where we can get their motion too, so we can get neurochemistry and motor behavior from the same subject. And there's a very high correlation between the uh, increases in extracellular dopamine and their movement. When I say activity, this is movement in the horizontal plane, walking, 
or running in this case. Um, and just to put this in some sort of context, this is percent basal, three three thousand percent basal. This is this is uh, you know three hundred times, thirty times more than normal. These animals are running as fast as they can, essentially. Yeah, this is a really incredible stimulant. Incredible stimulants like this are also readily self-administered. And I was talking to Dr. Chiara about this over lunch. Many times when you're teaching drugs how to press levers and drug self-administration, you do something called auto-shaping. You teach them how to press for um, pellets of food and you take many weeks to sort of condition these animals to the stimuli. Well, I can tell you that these data right here, these self-administration data are from drug-naive animals that have had no training whatsoever. And in the first day in the box, so these are self-administering animals. This is response, this is procession. This is acquisition day one, day five. Here we extinguish, that is we take away the drug so that the animal can't, when they, le they lever press, they still lever press, but there's no more drug for them to get. And you see uh, this extinguish, right? The response goes away because the animals aren't getting anything. But the point of this discussion here is, is that without any training whatsoever, the animals, by the second day, this is the active lever that gets some drug. This is the inactive lever, right? They're discriminating these levers essentially immediately without any training. They really love this stuff, and they'll take a maximum amount of presses per session. Synthetic hallucinogens, this is the next group, and uh, I have less data for these and for the other two, so we're almost finished. I know. These solution, uh, hallucinogens now are often referred to as N-bombs, and this is an acronym for a really long chemical name that I won't belabor you with. They consist of liquid or paper laced with drug. Oftentimes it's on sheets of paper that have dabs of dots of this uh, liquid cut into squares, very similar to the way LSD is used. Um, the more dangerous scenario is when people are playing with liquid N-bomb. This is how people have, have gotten really in trouble because, of course, your ability to dose by squeezing a dropper bottle is quite arbitrary. Somebody gets a, you know, the friends are having a joke with their friend and give him more than the rest. And in case of these drugs, they're so potent this can kill you. Once again, the structural um, the structure unique, right? The M-bombs are unique when compared to the classical LSD in terms of their structure. Uh, they have effects that are similar to LSD, but they can be much stronger. Um, and I, I, I even find making this statement unbelievable because back in the day, we always thought LSD was the strongest drug ever. Microgram amounts of LSD will send you on a ride for you know, 15 hours. This drug is even more potent than LSD. Uh, oral ingestion, perceptual distortion similar to the effects of LSD. Um, they're more potent. Increased heart rate, blood pressure, agitation. Most of the people are dying from excited delirium. This is a uh, same thing that kills people with bath salts, by the way. This has to do with the dysregulation of temperature first. So you get this really uh, elevated body temperature. The elevated body temperature starts to get breakdown of muscle tissue, right? Myoglobin and other proteins start to leak out into the bloodstream. This clog the kidney tubule and you die from multi-system organ failure. How synthetic hallucinogens work? Here we are back to our nerve terminal diagram. Here I'm showing you a PFC or prefrontal cortex serotonin terminal synapsing on a glutamate cell, a pyramidal cell. This is the principal output cell of the cortex. These are strongly modulated by 5-HT2A receptors. And you see there's our synthetic cannabinoid binding to the 2A receptor, causing an EPSP in a pyramidal cell. Binding of the hallucinogen to the 5-HT2 receptor. These are coupled to GQ. GQ then uh, enhances activity of phospholipase C. And this increases or stimulates uh, the firing and transmitter release in these particular pyramidal cells. Layer 5 pyramidal cells are a principal target for these drugs. M-bombs are chemically related to 2,5-dimethoxyphenethylamines, or the so-called 2C compounds. 
These were first made popular by Shulgin and his books, uh, like T-Cow, P-Cow, and this will be P-Cow, actually, right, because they're fennel on means. But the 2C moniker, the so-called 2C, this simply refers to the fact that there's two carbons between the phenyl group and the amine group. That's where this sort of colloquial term comes from. It's an amazing piece of SAR here. Normally, when you start to bulk up a molecule like this, like you start to bulk up a molecule like this, it'll lose selectivity and it'll lose potency. But in the case of the N-bombs, adding this methoxyphenyl group to this amine dramatically enhances their potency. Here we see some binding data. So this is receptor binding. It's very similar to the uptake curve I showed you, except the difference is you're not inhibiting uptake now. You're inhibiting binding of this very potent antagonist, M100907. Very selective 5-HT2C antagonist. As we increase our dose of NBOM, we can completely block this binding. Fully efficacious, 100% efficacious. The interesting thing here to note, which you probably already gathered, Look at the red circle. The filled circle is the N-bomb. The open circle is the corresponding 2C compound. Huge shift from the 2C compound to the N-bomb to the left. And it's at least tenfold in both cases. So the N-bombs are much more potent than the 2C drugs. What kind of endpoints do we look at for 2C activity? People use many different endpoints. The most common one is head shakes in mice. Right? Mice will exhibit these head shakes when you give the drug. But uh, truth of the matter known, I don't really like mice. I don't like them. I don't use them much in my lab, but we have knockout mice that we use sometimes. But I really don't like mice. And they have a propensity for my fingers. They like to eat me. They bite me a lot, so I don't like them. So we have established me methods in, in rat to look at 5-HT2A specific behavior. Uh, there is another thing about the mouse, though, in all fairness to the mice, which, again, I do hate the mice, but you only need very small amounts of compounds to work with mice. So if you only have small amounts of drug, the mouse models are much more uh, useful, right? Because you don't need much drug, and also you have all these genetic modifications. But more and more, we're getting genetically modified rats as well. In any, any case, let me get back to the point. You can in induce what are called wet dog shakes. Anybody here have a, a dog at home? Right? I don't have a dog at, at present, but I, I've always had dogs. They come in out of the rain and they, they do this shake, right? proximal shaking of the body. And this is a normal behavior for a rat, by the way, as well. Sometimes when a rat moves from one position to another position, especially when they're sleeping, they'll give them a wet dog shake and lay down and get comfy, right? What you see with these drugs is they enhance the uh, frequency of that behavior incredibly. So I only had 10 shakes or 12 shakes, but the way these experiments were done is time sampling. So you look at the animal for one minute every 10 minutes or something. And even with that little window of opportunity for observation, you can see a tremendous amount of shaking behavior and create these beautiful dose effect curves. So it's a great way to look at uh, 5-HT2A mediated behavior. And here is just showing you that the antagonist, if we give the ED50 dose of 0.7 mg per kg, in the presence of our antagonist, M100907, we completely eliminate these, these shakes. And by the way, in M100907, the animals are still walking around, they're still doing all the normal things, but no shaking. And if we look at the N-bomb in the exact same assay, there's a couple things here to note. One of the things is, we get an inverted U-shape. The other thing is, 10 times more potent. Again, lines up really nicely with the binding data that I showed you, right? The N-bomb's 10 times more potent than their corresponding 2C analogs. And also, it's reversed by M100907. Where's my, where's my helper? I'm good. That's right. I'm an IT professional. Hold on a minute. I need to find the...
I don't have my reading glasses. Actually, I can leave it up there. I don't even care. Down. Here? Show, show me where to get the full thing. Yes, I got, I've got my long distance, I got my zoom lenses on. I have distance glasses and don't laugh. When you get old, this will happen to you too. You have to have three pairs of glasses, one for close, one for middle, one for far, right? Um, okay, so now we're going to the last drugs. Thanks so much for your attention. I'm probably running over, I know. I talk too much. The last, but perhaps the most problematic drugs right now are the opioid NPS. Here you see a picture of acetylmorphine, the active ingredient of heroin, as compared to acetophentanyl, quite different in chemical structure. Methods of use are very similar to what you would see with heroin. Uh, the acute rush and euphoria, um, pain relief, of course, for people that are taking these things from a medical standpoint. Tolerance, dependence, addiction, bloodborne infection. Um, a lot of people are dying in the U.S. from these substances. I'm going to give a talk on Thursday that focuses on opioids, so I'm not going to give too much information at this talk on this, but people who die from these drugs are dying from respiratory depression. You have a, a rich, rich population of mu receptors in the brain stem. This is the area of automaticity of, of breathing, of diaphragmatic breathing. You paralyze this center in the brainstem, breathing stops and death ensues very quickly thereafter. Uh, once again, we got synthetic opioids that have emerged in the recreational drug market. And the one thing that I want to draw your attention to is there, there, there's fentanyl. And fentanyl is quite different than morphine and heroin. Morphine and heroin are plant derived uh, from the poppy. But here we have a, a piperidine, right? A phenyl ethyl piperidine structure. Completely different um, structure. It's very lipophilic. It gets into the brain just so effectively. And so what I show you here is acetylfentanyl killed hundreds of people in the United States. What's the difference between acetylfentanyl and regular fentanyl? You just, you just chopped off one methyl group. That's it. And this evaded detection and it evaded law enforcement until it was made Schedule 1. Here's the opposite, butyryl fentanyl, just add one more, right? And in the talk on Thursday, I'll show you lots of structural. Look at this fentanyl molecule. Most of the molecules I showed you previously, are, they're relatively simple in structure. Here, because you've got a complicated structure, you can add motifs here at the uh, alpha and beta carbon. You can add motifs here on the phenyl group. On this phenyl ring, actually this phenyl ring, you can add things here. You can do things to this propion, propionyl group. So there's just an endless variety of these things. If that wasn't bad enough, there's also these structural templates that have been resurrected by the Asian companies. And so we have structurally distinct non-fentanyl opioids that are also emerging in the marketplace. For example, U4770. Uh, this is a cyclohexyl. Uh, um, benzamide. Here we have uh, a cyclohexyl piperazine, and here we have a uh, phenyl sulfamide. Completely different than, than fentanyl. Right now, fentanyl analogs are still the predominant drugs in the marketplace. Furanyl fentanyl is really, really uh, a problem at this moment. Furanyl fentanyl and U47700 have been responsible for many uh, analytically confirmed deaths. Okay, so this is an important piece here. When we talk about somebody dying from substance, what do we mean? We mean that a person has presented to the emergency department. Uh, they died either prior to or at the emergency department. And you have uh, analytical confirmation of the causative agent from blood and tissue of what was associated with this death. How do opioids work? We go back to our synaptic diagram. These drugs hit inhibitory postsynaptic receptors. And here I'm showing a VTA, ventrotegmental area, opioid terminal. And uh, um, what happens with this uh, GABA receptor, GABA, GABA cell, excuse me, these opioids inhibit this GABAergic tone that's on dopamine nerve terminals, uh, cell bodies rather in the VTA. So this is actually a, an area that's involved in drug addiction 
And one of the ways that opioids increase extracellular dopamine is by disinhibiting GABA cells in the VTA. So there's our opioid hitting our inhibitory receptor. That receptor is coupled to G sub I, a binding of the drug to the receptor. G sub I then inhibits adenylase cyclase and you have subsequent inhibition of firing and transmitter release. And uh, I'm really close to the end, so thanks for your patience. We're almost there. Opioid MPS display profound differences in their analgesic potencies in male mice. One of the things that I'm going to show on Thursday is that many of these substances, when you look at a binding assay, they have about the same affinity as morphine in a binding assay. So they all have low to mid nanomolar affinity at the mu opioid receptor. But look what happens when they're administered in vivo. We see tremendous differences in their potency as analgesic agents. The number here is the EC50, right? This is the effective concentration for causing 50% analgesia. Analgesia is presented as max percent of the maximum possible effect, right? And so this drug, butyryl fentanyl, this fentanyl analog, which by the way is less potent than fentanyl. So this is a weak fentanyl analog. It's 30 times more potent than morphine. U4770 is 10 times more potent than morphine. So you can imagine the trouble here if these things are used as adulterants in heroin, right? These are actually mixed with heroin. And so these compounds are so much more potent than heroin, even a small amount, can inadvertently and accidentally cause death because the people that are taking these mixtures of heroin and NPS, they don't know it. They don't know that they're taking a mixture. So just to summarize, the NPS present a number of dangerous health risks. They can produce life-threatening adverse effects. Even though the biological effects of the NPS, they resemble their progenitors, but as I've shown you, many of them are much more potent than the drugs that they are mimicking. This third bullet point can't be stressed enough users aren't sure of what they're taking. They're not. They don't know what substances are in the pills or in the powders that they're taking. And they're becoming more prominent as adulterants and as counterfeit drugs or medications. The opioids are being uh, added to heroin as adulterants. Counterfeit drugs, ecstasy. A lot of the ecstasy picked up by the EU is not ecstasy. It's caffeinone analogs. What about medications? In the United States right now, we have a big problem with counterfeit pain medication. Pain patients can't get prescription drugs anymore, so they're buying clandestine pain medications. They don't contain oxycodone, they contain fentanyl or some of these other MPS. The last thing that I want to talk about is the translational, translational laboratory research, which I just described to you. It can't be stressed enough that this type of research plays a critical role in public health and safety. As examples, in my laboratory prior to doing the DDRU, we identified the role of serotonin transporters in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. We also identified the role of 5-HT2B receptors in valvulopathy, in car cardiac valvulopathy. This was all done in the kinds of animal experiments and in vitro experiments that I show you today. Any drug now that wants to be brought to market has to be screened for 5-HT2B receptors because this is known now that these receptor, this is a poison target. If your medication hits the 2B receptor, it can't move forward in terms of development because this valvulopathy is it's, it's a life-threatening condition. In a similar manner, you as scientists and clinicians you can either get translational research or use translational research in your practice. Bedside to bench to bedside research. That is, reports of the drug effects in humans, emergency room data, DEA data. This is the first, first line of, of, of information. Then to the bench, you can access the mechanism of these drugs in vivo and in vitro, and hopefully this will lead to strategies for prevention and treatment. 
findings from the DDRU, like I've presented to you now, they've been used to influence public health policy, not only in the United States, but on a global stage. Uh, many of the scheduling decisions by the DEA to make drugs legal or Ill illegal in this case was uh, they make these decisions based on data and there's very little human data there's no mechanistic human data and so in the United States you have to have a certain criteria of data before you can make a drug illegal and so they need preclinical pre information because you, you, you can't get clinical information on most of these obviously, for obvious ethical reasons. And finally, EMCDDA, they come out with annual reports and joint reports, and they've used a lot of my data. For example, the risk assessment data for MDPV and for uh, DMAR were also um, relied heavily on, on some of the uh, data that we've gotten from our laboratory. Um, I don't do so much in the lab anymore. I have lots of people that help me with this, and, and I, I do want to always express gratitude just incredible gratitude to the essential collaborators in my laboratory, the gifted scientists and passionate scientists who do this work. Chuck Schindler, Carl Lupica, Marilyn Eustis, Julie Marisic, Harold Sithe, uh, all of the work from the opioids. At the time the opioids broke in the United States, I had no opioid assays in my laboratory and Garrett Pasternak and his group were gracious enough to test many of these substances in their laboratory. So um, that's it, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bauer, for this uh, very important basic uh, um, basic uh, uh, analysis of the NPS uh, topic. I think that we should do some discussion here, so that perhaps there are people who want to ask uh, questions uh, and so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm free to ask. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you so much for your interesting lecture. And I was really intrigued by the chemical structure of the seeds I'm conducting from a college and an organic chemist. And so, uh, looking at the structures, especially of the first class of compounds that we can show it, uh, I remember well the THC analysis. Uh, you said that there are two different classes, the indoor and the indosol series, isn't it? Uh, the yes. Sorry. I can hear you. No, it's fine. I hear you. Yes. The, other, the other persons are not hearing me. Oh. No, it's okay. No, that's it. Okay. So I was. It's so correct. Sorry. It's correct. It is. It's so they largely replaced the endomoiety yeah. with an endosome. Yeah. I think this is my modest opinion that the most important feature in these two classes of compounds is not the uh, changing of the indo into imbezol, but the, uh, the, change, the dramatic change that you made uh, substituting the ketone with a, a diamide. Yep. And this is very imp important because the molecule now, the imbezol moiety now, is really very hydrophilic. It's not hydrophobic as the other ones, I mean the indoles. And this is this might be important because uh, because of uh, of the of the lipophilic hydrophilic uh, um, balance that is important to pass the brain barrier. But my question is: Have you have a, uh, started the molecular interaction between the receptor and these molecules? I mean. Uh, they are so different in chemical structure that you were saying that they are uh, acting as an agonist of a CB1 receptor, isn't it? But I, uh, do you think that they are um, uh, interacting with the, with the same part of the, of the receptor? Do you have a study something like this? I'm interested because uh, yeah, no, this from is a molecular a, point of this view. This is a really excellent question and in my hands, no. We have not studied this at all, this kind of thing. And even whether the CB1 receptor, I do believe that they do have information about the CB1 receptor pocket, the binding pocket, and so, um, yeah, my guess would be there probably are groups that are, you were talking about docking studies where you would, where you would use computer modeling of the pocket of the CB1 receptor to see how these drugs uh, fit in there, you know, how the drugs fit in there and why drugs of such different sort of chemical structure 
would bind to the same site and exert the same effect. By the way, those indissolved compounds, even though they got that, what is it, a carbamate or whatever that thing is? Yeah, yeah. A carbamate moiety, yeah. rather than, remember where it came yeah, from. Kitchen. There was a or, or, Well, or there was a naphthol. Remember, there, there, there used to be a huge naphthol moiety there as well. Oh, so, yes. so we went from a naphthol to a cyclopropyl to like this carbamate. So. You're right. This, this is, is very technical, but... Uh, yeah, I agree. Mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I was very no, I will try to answer to your question, because I will uh, be talking about cannabinoids. Oh. So, you know, to talk uh, without having the, the, the formulas uh, in front is very difficult to understand what yeah. we are talking about. Yeah. But I will address this uh, in my talk, okay? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, perhaps you. we can then discuss yeah. further. Um, any other question? Because, for example, one, I had one question for you, and that is uh, uh, the uh, alpha PVP, the, uh, the very potent um, catenone derivative, yes. alpha PVP, that is uh, very selective because it does not interact with 5-HT receptors only. You showed the dopamine, but what about norepinephrine receptors? Yeah, so the norepinephrine transporter data for those uh, drugs, excuse me, transporter, yeah, yeah, the net. So if I show, so the, uh, just for the sake of simplicity, I, I only showed the DAT and the CERT, but the dopamine transporter data and the norepinephrine transporter data look almost the same. Same. And this is actually, we find this a lot in the lab because you think the phylogenetic similarity between DAT and NET right the catechols yeah they're very similar for most of the drugs but there are some differences these drugs you mentioned very high affinity for that yeah very high affinity this is for uh, very very interesting because it is very difficult to separate the, the uh, specific i mean it's, it's almost impossible at least uh, in the series of uh, that inhibitors like uh, cocaine uh, this uh, um, uh, oh, derivative. It's very difficult to separate uh, the ability to block that from the ability to block net, norepinephrine transporter. And you know, there is a physiological basis for this, because as you know, the uh, norepinephrine transporter uh, takes up very efficiently dopamine. Actually, the affinity of dopamine for the norepinephrine transporter is higher than the affinity for the dopamine transporter. The difference is that the dopamine transporter has a higher, uh, I mean, the, 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 the number of molecules, the, the Vmax, the Vmax of the dopamine transporter is higher than the norepinephrine transporter for dopamine. But the affinity is lower. So it's very interesting that... So, so to comment on this point, yeah, that, that, that's true. So the first point is, can we get DAT, truly DAT-selective transporter drugs? Or the, the flip side is, can we get truly selective norepinephrine transporter drugs? And so you can definitely get selective norepinephrine transporter drugs like dizipramine, right. nisoxetine. An important point to note there is they're not self-administered and they are not perceived as uh, reinforcing at all. So that's one issue. The other issue is, as you mentioned, the femtomoles per milligram of protein, that is the density or the number of dopamine transporters in areas like the striatum and the nucleus accumbens, far, far much higher than norepinephrine transporter, but not everywhere. In, not in the cortex. In cortex, right? So your point about this promiscuous nature of the transporter, the DAT and the NET. In the cortex, you actually have more norepinephrine transporters than dopamine transporters, and those norepinephrine transporters are very effective at taking up dopamine. Yeah. You know that the first paper on this topic, uh, the first name was Carboni. That's right. <laughs> I was just explaining what we already knew. It's not here. But anyway, yes, that was, uh, this is actually what what happens in vivo, uh, in the cortex, in areas where there is uh, much uh, high concentration of norepinephrine, noradrenaline uh, terminals, uh, dopamine is taken up uh, preferentially by the noradrenaline terminals to the net rather than by dopamine. Yep. Uh, 
Um, sì, Walter, professor Fratta. Sì, il microfono. No, aspetta, aspetta, che arriva il microfono. My question is, in some spice drugs, there is a combination of cannabis, synthetic cannabinoids and opioids. I wonder if you have uh, ever studied the, this, the combination in terms of synergy, in terms of synergistic toxicity. No, we, we have never done anything like that, but you could envision a scenario which would be quite dangerous for uh, people who are taking these things. In fact, in the United States, we have fentanyl and the cocaine. Mm -hmm. They're putting fentanyl and the cocaine. Yeah, so they're putting fentanyl in spice products, they're putting fentanyl in cocaine, and so this is yeah. really very scary. And we have done nothing with, with interactions. And all of the substances, when people come to the emergency department, they're all poly drug users. It's not the exact same question you're asking, but this interaction of the different drugs is completely uncharted territory yeah. as far as I'm aware. This has not been studied at all. Because we know there is a strong interaction between cannabinoids and opioids in That's this right. mechanism of action. So That's right. I wonder if the combination could have a really a synergistic uh, effects. You know, because because opioids, the opioids produce an increase in, uh, in blood pressure. Opioids, they do. Yes. And cannabinoids also. 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 So this That's might right. be... Uh, and I, uh, one thing that I want, do you want to, one thing that I wanted to, you to consider what uh, Dr. Bauman said is the, what he called the counterfeit, the counterfeit, the counterfeit yeah. which basically means that many of these drugs that are sold under a certain name, in fact, do not contain the, the substance that is uh, indicated, or that is, well, they, they do not have the name written, but they, they say it like as amphetamine, or, or ecstasy, or heroin, or and in fact, because you know, this is very important, and I think that even in the drug, uh, in the drug agencies, not ENCDDA, because I think those are more aware of this, but uh, in the UNODOC, the, the, the United Nations. Uh, some of the, some of this phenomenon, I think, has been uh, under evaluated because uh, if you could only consider the, uh, the the overt utilization of these compounds, but there is a, a very, uh, you know underground uh, uh, landscape. It is related to the fact that they are used in place of the actual substances that are on face. And I think this is really probably the future. Because if you consider that to get heroin or cocaine, you have to take, you know, cultivate, extract, transport, purify, modify, etc., etc., it's much more easy just to get this to the internet. And you can pay much, much less. Uh, the control is much, much less, and there can be no, there can be no control for years. So I think this phenomenon is not at all going to die. I think it's going to go down and increase very much through this counterfeit. I think. What you think? I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, altre domande? Ok, so, thank you very much, we we'll go to the, uh, no, we did it to us. Tomorrow? Yeah, no. Yes, there is now the cocktail and uh, it's more or less. Si. Ah. And then, uh, see you tomorrow for the lesson, yeah, not all uh, stay, ah, and one okay. baby go away. Walter, do you know each other? No, no, I speak. Walter, he's a lawyer.
Excellent work with cannabinoids.